Ladies and gentlemen, this is Aaron from Des Moines Rocks.com. On the phone with me is Joel Cummins, keyboard keyboardist, pianist, and backup vocals for um, Freeze McGee. How are you doing today, Joel? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. So, uh, you guys are coming to Des Moines July 24th to play the Simon Estes Amphitheater again. Um, we are. It's uh, definitely one of, the, one of the cooler downtown amphitheaters in the country, and I think it's been a couple of years since we've we've been there, maybe 2011. So it'd be nice to be back. Yeah, I know for a while that was a regular tour stop for you guys for the Nightfall on the River series. We, we did that, and I think one year we had uh, some bad weather and we moved it inside. And then last year we were part of the uh, 8035 festival, which was also uh, really cool to be part of. Yeah, uh, that just happened here this year. Um, I know there's a significant chance that this show you guys have booked might be moved a block north to the Brenton Skating Plaza. They've been doing that with a lot of the shows there. Um, it's a similar size area, but they have a large canopy tent to keep everything nice and dry for everybody. Got it, got it. Is it still flooded down there in the riverfront right now? The rivers are really high right now. You know, we're a few weeks out still, so it remains to be seen, but we'll keep... Uh, We'll keep people posted on updates as far as that goes. I'm a uh, big Chicago Cubs fan, so uh, you know, Des Moines has been of particular interest to me lately with uh, Chris Baez, Javier Baez, and now Arzmendi Alcantara recalled, and of course Manny Ramirez joining the Iowa Cubs. So it's kind of uh, an exciting destination these days. Right, yeah, the Iowa Cubs have been, uh, they've been doing pretty good. They've been packing them in and putting on some good games. So, um, you guys just put out a new a new studio album just uh, just over a month ago, Similar Skin, and that's been getting uh, it's been getting pretty great reviews. Uh, um, I read that on this one that you made a concerted effort to make the songs more concise and trim the fat, so to speak. Uh, what can you tell us about that process? You know, honestly, that's that's kind of been our uh, our attitude well, with uh, with studio music since uh, since about 2002 we, we, we kind of made a conscious decision to keep the the live feeling and the studio thing two completely separate things as far as artistic statements and um, you know we, you're always trying to put out something that is a song that will stand on its own and, and so for this uh, this particular album I, I, you know we tried to go with more of a uh, rock vibe and writing uh, writing some pretty concise rock songs of course there are uh you know, really two tracks on there that are, that are pretty uh, uh, pretty out there as far as the arrangements go. Those would be Educated Guests and the other one is Bridgeless. Uh, so there, there are certainly uh, still some kind of more uh, symphonic elements and, and some really uh, deep progressive uh, compositional stuff in there. But yeah, we, we, we really wanted to, uh, you know, to try to get to the essence of the songs and, and to, uh, to put those in, in a... Uh, in, in a light that uh, that really made them shine in the studio. Right on, yeah, I was reading up on uh, the website which you guys talked about the album and uh, saw Pantera as one of the influences on there. That uh, that seems interesting to me. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we've, we've um, our influences are all over the place. I mean, I, I definitely completely wore the ink off of uh, Metallica's and Justice for All when I was a kid. And yet at the same time, you know, I was working on um, solo piano music like Beethoven and Schubert and WC and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think that's kind of the cool thing. We, we, we've, we've chosen a particular vibe on this one, which is that, that heavier rock element and try to kind of channel our energies around that. Um, yeah, Pantera is definitely uh, you know, a, a band that we're, uh, we're all fans of. Uh, you know, there might even be a little uh, little Black Sabbath or something in there too. But we we, we really wanted to uh, to get dirty and get heavy. And, and there are a couple tracks on there that I think uh, I think will really surprise people uh, about maybe what they would expect on Praise Me to sound like. Right, and for a band that plays a lot of the so-called jam band festivals, as they coin them all. Uh, you guys have never really shied away much from the from being the, one of the heaviest bands on the festival and not uh, shying away from rocking out. I remember uh, Walker Russo 2010. You guys did Doctor Feelgood. That was a that was a surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, there's we're just kind of we're just kind of being ourselves, and that's that's something that is definitely a part of our sound. And it's interesting because. We're, you know, kind of one of the only rock bands that also seems to get booked on the uh, the more electronic festival things like uh, Electric Forest or 
Somerset. And, you know, while that's an element of our sound too, um, you know, you just, you just never know what, what's going to happen in a uh, particular show. And sometimes they'll end up being more of one thing, sometimes more of another, but we try not to let the, uh, try not to let the, wherever we are to really dictate what we're doing too much and just, just go out there and do what we do. Right, because uh, short of the jam band festival scene, there's not, you don't have a whole lot of progressive festivals that focus more on the progressive types of music. That's, uh, yeah, this is true. Uh, and I wish there were more uh, things like that that we could, uh, we could kind of do to to, uh, to to get those those fans a little more aware of, uh, of our music. But, you know, I guess it's gradually happening, slowly but surely. And you guys are sort of one of the crossover bands. Your appeal is not just to progressive fans or just to jam band fans. You have fans of fans of any genre can, have gravitated to Humphreys McGee, regardless of what they would label as their favorite kind of music. You guys have the, that crossover appeal that bands strive for that's so elusive for most. I think we uh, said it best with our second album title, which was called Songs for Older Women. Right. <laughs> Right, that was right after Greatest Hits Volume 3, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we actually got uh, one of my favorite stories from that is we got an email from somebody in Germany saying, we came across Greatest Hits Volume 3 and, you know, we really love all the songs, but we can't seem to find any of the albums that these songs were on. And on the back of the album cover, we had made up uh, previous fictitious albums and, like, you know, peak chart positions and all this stuff. <laughs> and... Uh, and somebody bought it and was, was trying to find the other stuff. So they actually thought this was, like, the best of, you know. <laughs> right. It's been uh, a band for, uh, I think, three months at that point, and those were our, uh, those were our eight original songs that we had. Um, now, speaking of those older albums, um, those in your discography and in your merch store are listed as no longer available. Is there ever any plan to re-release some of that in, so, in some form or another for fans to get their hands on? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting question, but now that we uh, we have our own record label, we definitely uh, we definitely have the means to, uh, to to do a lot of things. So um, we have a few other projects kind of in the works right now. Um, I know one of them is going to be where we've been talking about this now for a few years, and because we never did it in the first place, but we're going to um, uh, most likely remix and uh, remaster Anchor Drops and put it out on vinyl for the first time. So uh, that'll probably happen sometime next year. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's just one of those things where maybe we'll get to it, but we've always been more about focusing on, uh, you know, whatever kind of our more current and updated sound is. So, uh, so you definitely have that too, but uh, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't rule out uh, Putting out some of those, uh, putting out some of those things again in the future, and you know, especially now that music is available uh, digitally, uh, I'm sure it's out there somewhere anyway. So, you know, what, my, what's what's holding us back? <laughs> right. Well, speaking of being on your own label now and uh, digital distribution and handling all that stuff yourself, um, what uh, what differences have you guys seen between going your own route versus being on a label and going through? All the all the processes with somebody else versus having all the control yourselves. Well, you know the the two most obvious things are kind of the the yin and yang of it, and that is that you know it's a lot more work uh, for all of us, and you know some of us more than others uh, as far as that goes. But then you know ultimately it's it's just a much more rewarding thing as well because you're realizing that everything you're doing here, this is a representation of you and, and you're doing it all on your own. And I think there's even, a, there's more of a connection uh, between the fans and the recorded music uh, as a result. Um, you know, it's just kind of nice, I think, for them to know that they're buying an album and it's not going to some, uh, you know, to some middle entity that they may or may not really have a connection with. Um, so, you know, that, that aspect of it has, has been great. And, you know, the fact that uh, this one was, uh, I think it de- debuted at 49 on the charts, and that, that's the best we've ever done as far as a uh, release debut. So um, to have that happen with the, the album that we put out on, on our own and on our own label was, uh, was, was really a, a great accomplishment. 
Mm-hmm. Very proud of that. And, you know, more and more radio stations are, are still picking, picking it up now at this point. So, you know, it's great. The, uh, the word's definitely getting out. And, um, yeah, I'm really proud of, really proud of, uh, you know, especially the, the label team and management team for, for doing such a great job with, uh, with this, what they've done so far. Okay, now the Nothing Too Fancy Music, the record label that you guys started, is that a, sort of a flagship label just to release some Freeze McGee material, or are you guys planning on expanding the roster and scouting for other artists of a similar vein, or what's the future plan for the label? When we started it, this, we, you know, we, we said, obviously, for a short-term thing, this is going to be for us, and... Uh, you know, it's it's proven to be so much work to do do a good job of uh, you know just focusing on that. Um, you know, we don't we don't want to create some big corporation. I think we want to keep it fairly intimate, and that's not to you know rule out to say that we won't do that at some point in the future. But uh, but for now, it's, this is definitely going to be an avenue for our music and for us to put out all kinds of different things. And you know, the nice thing is we can. We can figure out ways to do things. Maybe there'll be some things that early runs of five thousand or ten thousand, and uh, so we can kind of you know, manage that ourselves, depending on what we're uh, what we're feeling like we want to do. And more bands seem to be going that direction. I just spoke with Cake a few weeks ago, and they just recently launched their own record label too, sort of as a flagship label. And they debuted, I, I, I want to say it's something like number nine on Billboard's two hundred as an independent label, which is very hard to do, to say the least. No doubt, no doubt. It's, uh, it's definitely an accomplishment. So, yeah, it's just, you know, it's nice to have that. We've, we've always kind of been about uh, making our decisions and creative control, and, you know, and for the album, you know, Manny Sanchez co- co-produced it with us, and so it's something where we have a lot of, a lot of really, uh, a, lot of, a lot of passion about, about the band within the, the, you know, the members of the band and management. We, you know, we have a lot of good thinkers and a lot of good ideas. So, uh, you know, we kind of, now that we're 17 years old as a band, it kind of feels like, well, maybe we should know what we're doing a little bit. <laughs> right. Um, okay, and you're, you've got a little bit of a reputation yourself as a collector. Um, uh, it says you've got a collection of 119 keyboards and you use six to seven at a time live. Wait, how many keyboards? 119 <laughs> is what they have you listed at. I, that's in your bio on your website on the Humphrey site. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's uh, that must be in the same bio where it says uh, I'm from Metropolis, Illinois, with the uh, direct line of blood to Superman. They're uh, you know a classic case of uh, exaggeration, but I'm sure that I'm sure my crew feels like I have 119 keyboards. So um, I'm definitely a, uh, a huge proponent of. Uh, of analog sounds and, and really going after high quality and, and um, you know, so that that's something that I think uh, you'll see throughout my collection, but, you know, I've got um, a B3 and a Fender Rhodes and a Mini Mode Voyager and um, uh, I recently added a, a, a kind of hybrid, uh, one of the, a, a new Mellotron that, uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, I've got a Roland Juno 60, um, so yeah, I have I have quite a few uh, quite a few different ones, but uh, I'm gonna fall very short of 119. I, I would uh, I'd put it at about probably 22 or 23. And how much how much difference is there between the setup of keyboards you use live and the choices you use in the studio for keyboards? Um, you know the the main difference. I honestly use most of. Uh, most of what I play with live, I'll use in the studio as well. The main difference, I would say, would be uh, an acoustic piano, and I'll use either an upright or uh, or a you know a grand to do some uh, piano stuff in the studio, which just sonically is not really possible with how loud our band is live. Um, so that you know that's really the only uh, the only major difference. Uh, there, there are of course other keyboards that I'll use in the studio sometimes, but for the most part. I'm trying to create stuff on the keyboard that I have so that I can uh, I can play those live without too much digital manipulation once we get to that point. I think, yeah, I know some keyboard players will just go in and play a MIDI control keyboard player part the whole way through and then pick all their sounds after the fact. But, uh, 
but it's definitely more yeah, we, definitely more organic to use the stuff you use on tour. Yeah, well, and you know, like I said, and just using the analog sounds because there's there's kind of a human element. You know, Keith Jarrett talks about it a lot about the actual connection when you're playing a stringed instrument and you're hitting a key, and that key is uh, activating a hammer that's plucking the string and hitting the string, and then there's a, the physical vibration, like. You know, there really is something to be said for that that you you can't undermine, and you can you can tell when it's missing. Sometimes it's you know it's impossible to to actually pinpoint or identify, but you can tell when it's not there. Yeah, and a good producer can in the right room can really uh, make all the whole world of difference on acoustic instruments like a piano. So absolutely, absolutely, that lets them have a little more control over it. Well, um, I know we're. Uh, about at our time, I don't want to eat up your whole day, but uh, it's been great talking to you. Again, uh, July 24th at Simon Estes Amphitheater, Umphreys McGee will be coming to melt faces and shake butts for all of all of us here in Des Moines, Iowa. That's right. We can't wait. And, uh, you know, should, be, uh, should the show end up being at the Simon Estes Amphitheater, I'll just ask all the people that are going to go sit on the bridge, you know who you are, you know, Come down and at least you know buy some merch or something. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's try, a little... try, to give, try to give them a little bit of a hard time at the show too. It's uh, it's, it's one of the more unique uh, venues where you can do that. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Uh, and you guys, you guys uh, do almost almost as many festivals this time of year as you do venue dates, right? Yeah, this is uh, this is true. This this summer is leaning a little bit more uh, toward the, the venue side. Uh, seems like the kind of the trend things have gone toward is we'll do festival dates early in the summer and then kind of do a proper tour later in the summer. So uh, so it's really nice, actually, this uh, this particular tour that's coming up. I think we have four weeks of shows, and I think we're only playing two festival dates. So it'll be uh, it'll be nice to set up and play uh, two sets for everyone. Right on. There is one other thing I meant to ask you about uh, while I got you on the phone. Um, I remember oh, yeah, sure. the, the first time I played summer camp with Sirius Minor was in 2010, or no, 2011. And uh, you guys did a Sunday afternoon set with Huey Lewis as Huey Lewis and the Rumors. Or was that 2012? Right. Now, uh, how, how did that come about? And is that, uh, do you guys know Huey or was it a man- management connection? Or that seems like a pretty interesting choice of mix. It worked great, don't get me wrong, but it just, how did that idea come about? How did that happen? Yuri's been a friend of ours for, uh, I guess it's about nine years now, and uh, we met originally at, um, I think where it was, I, w- I want to say it was the Madison Square Garden Theater, where they were doing the, uh, what used to be the jammies, and, and Pete Shapiro would, uh, would pick kind of different people to put together, so we ended up, uh, Huey, somebody who knew Huey, knew us and said, oh, th- these are some guys that you should you should consider doing this with. This would be a good idea. And uh, so they were able to talk him into doing it. And uh, and then he came down and sang a couple songs with us. And we ended up, uh, Sinead O'Connor came out and Mavis Staples. And so we had, we had Huey and Mavis and Sinead all on stage at the same time. And, you know, we're all kind of looking at each other like, it's really happening? What is going on? And um, and so we we really hit it off with Huey. We ended up recording uh, recording a vocal thing for uh, our track one line and song from uh, from the Safety and Numbers. And uh, you know the rest is history. We've been buddies ever since. And you know we've we've sat in with the news before, and he's come and uh, sat in with us a number of times. And so we just we came up with uh, with that idea that it'd be fun to do a set with him. And to, he just put out a uh, an album of. Uh, uh, kind of rare stack songs uh, that he was uh, he was promoting. So we did a couple of those with the horn section and some singers, and then we did a couple of his uh, hits. So uh, and then he learned a couple of our tunes too. So it was really this really uh, cool collaborative thing that we were able to pull together. And uh, I'm hoping we'll we'll get to do it again uh, sometime soon. So it's it's definitely something that uh, we'd be up for again. It was quite surreal, see, <laughs> but. Uh... <laughs> All right, well, it's been great talking to you, and we're definitely looking forward to the show on the 24th, and we will keep our audience posted as to if anything changes with the show due to the high river levels or weather or anything else. And uh, good luck with the tour, and we'll see you when you make it to town. All right, sounds 
Sounds good. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joel. Bye. Yeah.